det är klart att politiken nyttjar som krävs. Ja. Men, men nu börjar känna sig så akut. Ja. Good morning this beautiful summer day in Visby. Uh, welcome to a seminar about climate change leadership. What is climate change leadership? Hmm. Well, uh, the starting point for this uh, topic or the starting point for, for this seminar is that uh, mankind's behavior uh, affecting the future. And I think that's not very controversial to, to, to say that. The mankind's behavior affects the future. And leaders' decision and, and, and messages affecting mankind. So the leadership is through the mankind or by the mankind directly related to to mankind's capacity to carry out a transition uh, uh, towards a sustainable future. The leadership perspective is one key perspective of mankind's possibility to, to lead us into a sustainable future. So, the question for this seminar is, how, how should effective leadership for reducing climate change look like? How can we develop an effective leadership taking us from words to action? It's a lot of discussions and, and it's a lot of awareness about the needs of a, a transformation of the society, a transformation of mankind's behavior. But it seems to be very difficult to move from words and discussion to real actions. So what kind of leadership do we need and how can we formate a good leadership for this kind of, of, of needed transition? Saturday day, uh, Saturday's daily newspaper Dagens Nyheter had an article about one of our great climate leaders. Who is she? Greta, of course, yes! <laughs> Maybe some of you read this article in Dagens Nyheter about uh, Greta Thunberg uh, and, and about her new book. She, I think it's a book, kind of compilation of her speeches uh, uh, she have had for, uh, in relation to different uh, uh, groups and, and different places in, in, in Europe. Well, however, the article told us that the explanation for Greta Thunberg's unique and perhaps historic impact is that she has shown leadership where other leaders have failed. Okay, she has shown leadership where other leaders have failed. That's quite interesting, how she has become a leader who showed leaderships where other leaders have failed. How does it come? 16 years old, sitting with her sign striking, and she's described as the leader who has showed a leadership where other leaders have failed. What kind of unique skills does she have? Uh, how should a leadership look like then that is not described as failing? Uh, I mean, here we have a panel of, of, of leaders, uh, and, and what have we done at the university and, and uh, as politicians and representing uh, industry? What have we done that didn't really work, uh, but she did? Okay, to deepen our knowledge of how good climate leadership should work, we from Uppsala University have therefore invited a panel of skillful thinkers and leaders. Welcome for joining us in this, as we think, very important seminar. And some words about the setup for this morning then. The setup is that we start with a keynote speech by Kerry Faser in the center. Maybe that's why you're in the center. Oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, and then we have some other panelists who give their perspectives uh, on, on the climate change leadership issue. And after that, we enter into a discussion for maybe 20, 25 minutes where we discuss uh, our different perspectives and we, we discuss the topic, how can we, what kind of leadership do we need to, to support and, and drive a transi transition in, in society towards a more sustainable future. 
And after that discussion, we open up the, the panel discussion where we invite you. If you have qu questions, maybe you have the answers, the solutions or so, or just comments. So we invite you for some minutes. And finally, uh, I uh, try to sum it up if it's possible. Or I just put off the microphone and say, this was too complicated. Well, we see. Okay, of course, now you're curious about our panel of skillful thinkers and leaders. Kerry Faiser, welcome, visiting professor at Uppsala University, specializing in climate leadership, uh, coming from the University of Bristol. And Kerry is a professor of the future of education and society, and she researches the relationship between formal education institutions and the surrounding society. Uh, uh, and Åsa Wikfors, uh, philosopher and writer, professor of uh, theoretical philosophy at Stockholm University. And two years ago, you published the book Alternative Facts about the knowledge and its enemies. It's about fact and knowledge resistance. Yeah. Uh, and you are the newest elected member of the Swedish Academy. So, so here I wrote the Swedish Academy, not professor at the university. That's more interesting, I think, in this. I haven't actually started yet. OK, <laughs> Com coming uh, <laughs> member of the Academy. Welcome. Christina Passion, uh, you have represented the social democracy in the Swedish uh, parliament for many years, and you have been? Short time. Short time, OK, it's, it's a relative perspective. <laughs> You have, been, uh, you, have, you have been in the European Parliament, and you have been Deputy Governor of the Riksbank, and you founded the think tank uh, Global Utmaning, Global Challenges, or Global Challenge 2005, I think. And uh, until the last government reform, you was Minister for Strategy and Future Issues, uh, popularly called Minister of the Future. It's an it's amazing uh, title, isn't it? Yeah. John Hassler. Uh, member of the Committee for the Prize in Economic Science in memory of Alfred Nobel, or former? Until, until recently. <laughs> until recently, <laughs> okay. And you have served as chairman of the Swedish Fiscal Policy Council and worked as advisor in the Swedish Ministry of Finance, professor and deputy director at the Institute for International Economic Studies at Stockholm University, and member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Science. So that's why it says the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Science there. <laughs> I could have a, a, a write the professor, but that's, that's more interesting. OK, Anna Rutgersson, professor of metro, metro, meteorology. Metro, <laughs> meteorology. <laughs> Yeah, okay, at Uppsala University, senior advisor for sustainability issues at, uh, at the Uppsala University, and you work on raising sustainability uh, issues to a larger perspective and promoting interdisciplinary collaboration at the university. And me, myself, I'm Klaus Palm, I'm working as a researcher at Uppsala University with climate uh, change-related issues, try to create an enabling environment at Uppsala University for our 5,000 researchers to research on uh, perspectives related to, to a sustainable future. Kerry Faiser, uh, what do you say about how leadership for reducing climate change should look like? Is this my cue to start? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Klaus. Okay. Um, so thank you for the invitation, and thank you for being here, and thank you also for allowing this to happen in English, which I have a horrible feeling is my fault, um, so it's very much appreciated. My Swedish at the moment basically consists of asking for fika, which is, I know is clearly the most important thing to know how to say in Swedish, so thank you. Um, so thanks for the invitation for joining this discussion, and um, for me, critically, leadership is collaborative, and I think one of the most important challenges we have when we think about how we're going to address climate change is how to build good conversations between different groups of people. And I want to start off with a few stories. Um, a few weeks ago, I was sitting in a cafe with a colleague who's actually in this room, and we were sitting talking about climate change and how we might adapt. And a gentleman sort of 
interrupted the conversation. He was sitting next to us and he had this orange jumper on and he was frustrated and he was angry. And he jumped in and he said, you, you seem like intelligent people. You seem like you've done loads of research. What, what are you talking about? He said, yes, things are getting hotter, but, but the energy prices, we can't deal with the energy prices. People in England are dying from the energy prices, he said. At which point I thought, well, there's a longer history there about energy privatisation in the UK, which is the main reason that people are dying from energy prices. However, it was an interesting intervention. And it made me think of another event recently, which was when I was first coming up to Uppsala. I was taking the train from France and I was driving to the train station and we were getting to the crossroads. And as we approached the crossroads, there were a group of people in yellow jackets standing. And they were saying, you, no, you're, you're not going anywhere. Um, and I had to get out of the car and explain that if I missed this connection, I missed two days worth of travel. And they were very nice and they let me through. But they explained that the reason that they were protesting was because they were living in the countryside and they had very little money and Macron's environmental taxes, as they called it, were going to mean that they couldn't get their kids to school, were going to mean that they couldn't do all sorts of things, at the same time as Macron was not taxing the elites in France in terms of their flying. Now, interestingly, once I got on the train, the train ended up being half an hour late. And it was half an hour late because a wild boar, who'd lost its natural <coughs> environment, had made it onto the tracks. So why am I telling these stories? I'm telling them because I think they highlight some really important questions about how we think about climate change um, and how we build conversations about climate change. I've spent the last six years in the UK leading a programme called Connected Communities that brings together universities and partners across the country. We've had huge success in building relationships between policymakers, academics, um, civil society groups. But what worried me about this after six years, <laughs> should have spotted it earlier, um, was that effectively we were still having conversations amongst ourselves. Many of the people involved in the discussions from civil society, from outside universities, were highly educated. With PhDs, they were working in professional roles. And the picture is the same across the whole of Europe. A recent study basically pointed out that most of the collaborations between universities and partners found about over 60% of them also have PhDs. So there's a problem here that I see, which is the risk is that we're making partnerships, we're trying to develop joint leadership and joint action around climate change, but we're doing it having rational, quiet conversations with people who already agree with us about what to do. And we're forgetting the two things that just interrupted the stories that I've told. First, the people who are excluded from decision-making processes, who see environmental policies as just the latest in a long line of things that are going to make them poorer. And second, the wild boar, or nature, who isn't going to wait for us to finish our conversations, who's already sticking his nose in with wildfires and droughts. So the question I think we need to ask when we're thinking about climate change leadership is how do we have difficult conversations that recognise that we are not in control of nature, we cannot manage the climate. We can only manage our own behaviour. And that we as a human species are not all the same sort of person. Even in our Western societies, there are very different sets of values and huge inequalities. So I think in relation to the conversation that we're having today, we need to work out and quickly how, yes, we bring different groups together. But we also need to figure out how to bring in those communities that are not historically <coughs> at this table for discussion. We need to do this for reasons of fairness. It's the richest 10% of the global population who are creating the emissions. That's all of us in this room. But we also need to do it for reasons that we do not know everything. We don't have the answer to everything. There is huge knowledge, experience and ideas amongst the wider population that we lose if we don't engage with people outside our bubbles. I want to finish with an example. A few years ago in Bristol, my home university, we were going out into the city. We were proudly leading the way with our city industry partnerships. We had a smart city agenda. We were going to mobilize smart technologies to address climate change. Uh, we could see the cutting edge future. And we were going out into the city and we were starting to talk with people in uh, an area of high levels of minority ethnic groups. These groups effectively laughed at us. 
They said, you're trying to tell us how to solve climate change. We have seen how much food waste you generate. We've seen how much you fly. We've seen how much the technology solutions that you're giving us are going to cost. Your solutions are not our solutions. We have other ways of addressing these issues. And this was a catalyst for us to start thinking very differently about what partnership means. We developed a program in collaboration with the community radio stations in the city called the Green and Black Ambassadors to begin to work alongside those groups to start to build from the ground up strategies to address climate change that start from the real problems and interests and concerns of these communities. It is a model that is fundamentally inclusive, starting from the needs of people outside our laboratories and universities, and it sees the question of how do we live with a changing climate as an urgent democratic question. So to conclude then, I want to say that if we want to think about building partnerships, collaborative and distributed leadership, we need to say who is not in this room and how can we start to learn from and engage with them as we develop new ways of living. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kerry. Very good. Okay, dialogue, collaboration, new partnership. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I can see that if we see, for example, the development of Norra Djurgårdstaden in Stockholm, uh, building a new part of the city, it's extremely high prices for the housing there, and, and it's just the upper middle class who can afford to live there, and it's climate smart houses who are actually energy positive, so they generate more electricity than they consume, but who can afford to live there? The upper middle class and, and so on. So that's just an example, I think, of what you say. Åsa. What do you say? What perspectives do you have on climate change leadership? Well, um, I think, yeah, collaboration is key, and I'm going to get to that. I can just start by saying a couple of words about the stuff that I do research on, which is uh, science denial, more generally, um, where people, it's not just a question of not doing what you should do, given the science, it's a question of not believing the science. Mm. Um, and we do, um, there, there are several areas where this is now rampant. One that we read about today in the paper is, again, is the vaccine issue, of course, mm. which is uh, creating uh, lots of problems throughout the world now with increasing uh, levels of uh, measles and so on. <coughs> but then there is climate denial too. Um, and I just wanted to say, in terms of the role of the universities and the role of researchers and spreading the knowledge here, I want to say a couple of encouraging words there. I mean, science denial, where you are motivated not to believe the science, is a type of psychological mechanism, largely unconscious. There's some reason the science is not uh, challenges beliefs that are very important to you. Uh, and when that happens, you, more or less unconsciously, will respond by resisting the evidence that comes to you. And when it comes to climate research, the evidence comes in terms of climate researchers saying something that you more or less don't understand, but you just have to take for granted. And that's also a challenge. It's complicated science. We don't understand it. I don't understand it. I just trust the scientists. So why should this person trust these scientists when they clearly challenge some very important belief they have? Um, and now, and there is a psychological profile also to climate um, <coughs> denial. It tends to be people who have a more conservative worldview. Not so shocking, Kasia. Maybe not so surprising. Maybe because, um, of course, climate change forces radical changes of society. And if you're conservative, you're not going to like that. So that's the conflict. That's the psychological source of the science denial in the case of climate change. Um, so that's a challenge, but I just want to say a, a few encouraging words there about uh, our role as researchers, and that is that it does help to inform about the science. Now, there's been some indication that sometimes people just this completely closed down, they won't listen to anything. In fact, there's been talk about backfire effects, where people believe the false thing even more strongly after getting the science information. That doesn't seem to be so common. So it really does pay off to give the uh, information to the extent one can about the basic science uh, and to keep pumping that out. So don't give up. Uh, there are strong sides on the other side, right, who spread disinformation, like the oil industry and so on. They have an interest in doing that. But we as researchers have to not give up, not let that take over. Keep sending out, communicating the science as best as we can, and also 
communicate about how those other agents who spread the disinformation, how they work. They have certain ways of skewing the data, of the, the certain methods of making us, of fooling us. We need to expose that. That's one important thing we have to do as researchers. Uh, then I just want to say, so most people, of course, are not science deniers. They believe the science, and yet they don't want to do what they are required to do. I, myself included, don't do everything I should be doing. Uh, and that's the challenge that you were talking so much about, where you get this conflict of interests, which is just this fundamental challenge that we stand in front of now. And I think there, democracy is really <laughs> how you do your democratic uh, conversations, as it were, or uh, interactions, absolutely essential. And I believe in this participatory approach. Uh, participatory budgeting has been shown to work quite well when it comes to counteracting populism. Mm -hmm. And I imagine participatory approach uh, would also, on the local work, uh, level, work quite well. Say that your town is being threatened by a rising river levels or something. Mm -hmm. if, if you get your citizens to get involved there, <coughs> I think it will be easier to get them motivated to accept that, yes, yeah, something really is happening and we may have to have higher gas prices or whatever. But it has to come, come that way. I think that's a really important point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, it's very um, positive to hear that you say it pays off to inform about knowledge and that we should never, we should not give in <laughs> or give up. Uh, and the majority, they really listen to, to, to what we have to say. That, that's great. And to return back to Greta Thunberg, that's one of her key messages. Listen to the scientists. Uh, I don't have the solution, uh, but the, the scientists m might have. Uh, participatory approach, very close related to what Kerry said. Uh, Anna, what do you say about uh, the climate change leadership uh, perspective? Yeah, I think from a university leadership perspective, I think the most important contribution we can have from the universities in general, but in particular in this case, is we are core actions, education and research. We need to work with our educational programs and we need to work with the engaged students that we have so many of in the universities. But we also need to make sure that the research we are performing at the universities address uh, the, the relevant questions and uh, good collaboration between different disciplines in order to, to, to look at the, the hard questions in the society. And I also think a little bit related to what we heard before, I think it's the responsibility of the scientists at the university to address the difficult questions and the uncomfortable solutions. It's very easy to go out and agitate and say we need to do something, but we need to look at the balance between what can we do and what are the consequences of what we can do. And we need to think about mitigation of climate change in relation to adaptation. We need to balance these two aspects and what are the costs and what are the benefits. So I think our main responsibility is to, to address the difficult uh, and to lift the difficult questions because that I think can make society have uh, faith in the, in the research community. Uh, so we need to evaluate actions as well as non-actions, I think is an important <coughs> point. Okay, thank you, Anna. <laughs> uh, yes. Because I think what we can see at the university, we, we, we know that uh, a sustainable future, sustainable development normally is described through three uh, sub perspectives, the, the environmental uh, sustainability, the social sustainability and the economic sustainability. And sometimes we can see that uh, means taken to to achieve uh, an environmental sustainability costs us a social sustainability or economic sustainability. And I think that's right. We really have to, co to see it on a, on a holistic perspective where we work together from different university disciplines to, to see that the technological uh, uh, in, uh, inventions and technological steps we're taking have to be analyzed through a social perspective as well and what kind of effects it could give in society, positive and negative. Okay, uh, John, yep. what do you say? What is the solution? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to 
start uh, saying a few words about climate denial and, and how research results are communicated and, 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 and thought of in the public. And I think the way science results are communicated is not very accurate and not very productive either, actually, for a reasonable discussion about these issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, so on, in particular, culture pages in the newspapers, we, we often hear that it's sure that uh, we're going to get catastrophic impacts of climate change, and, and this is going to potentially lead to the end of civilization. That's not a good representation of science. Uh, what the science has said, in particular, if you read the IPCC reports, is that there is a very large uncertainty around these issues. So, so one measure that you often uh, use is uh, the climate sensitivity, how much global warming you get for a doubling of the CO2 concentration. And what IPCC says there is that likely uh, that uh, uh, number is between one and a half and four and a half degrees. Uh, if it is one and a half degrees, then this is not a very large problem. If it is four and a half degrees, it's a very big problem. And this is what I think should be communicated. And I, when I talk to climate deniers, in, in particularly in the US, we don't have so many here in, this, in Sweden anymore, I state this, that it may very well be the case that you are right, that this is not a very big problem. That's actually what, what comes out from the IPCC reports. And when you give it that to them, they also have to accept that the opposite is a possibility, that this might be a very big problem, and we yet do not know. In our, then, what should we do about it? In, in our research, uh, what we have found is that uh, the consequences of a too lenient climate policy that turns out in the end to, to, to be wrong because climate change was a much bigger problem. It was maybe three and a half or four and a half degrees climate sensitivity. The, the consequences of, of, of uh, using a too lenient policy is very, very bad, very costly for society. But the opposite is not. So if we act uh, under the assumption that this is a very big problem, that maybe climate uh, sensitivity is four and a half degrees, we devise an appropriate policy for that, and then afterwards it turns out that, that it wasn't so bad as we thought. The social cost of that, if the climate policy is devised in a clever way, is not very large. And when you have come to that uh, 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 level of discussion, then most people agree that it's a, it's, this is a, a clever climate policy, is a fairly cheap uh, insurance policy ag against a potentially very bad outcome. But the key then is that you have to devise a clever policy. And in order to do that, uh, you must realize that climate change is a global uh, issue. Climate change affects uh, uh, all, of, all parts of the world. It's driven by global processes. We need a global solution. Uh, and what, what we found, and I think there is almost unanimous agreement about social scientists, uh, at least economists about that, that you must uh, price carbon emissions. You must come to an agreement globally about a carbon price. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Other policies, uh, like subsidies to technology, nudging people not to fly and things like that, are probably reasonably good complements, but they are not substitutes. So that has to be done. Uh, and, 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 and so I think leadership must be that you point to the problem, let people realize that there's big uncertainty about these issues, and also point to the solution that if we do this in a clever way, doesn't have to be uh, very costly. Uh, and I, th I think that's what we need to do. These other things like pushing researchers not to fly and things like that, I think that just misses the point and is in effect actually dangerous in the sense that it takes away the focus from the real thing. Thank you, Jon. <laughs> okay, I, I think we have a lot of uh, uh, thinkers and politicians uh, Agreeing on that we one very good solution would be tax system for carbon dioxide. Do you think it's possible? The sad thing is that despite decades of international negotiations about these issues, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the question about uh, how to introduce a minimum price of carbon has not really been on the table. Mm. And when I talk to climate negotiators, they say that the reason for that is that the governments have been mainly represented by ministers of, of the environment, 
who have got the instruction from their finance ministers that not, not to talk about uh, taxes because that's our job. So the sad thing is that I don't. I think people say that it's impossible. I don't think that's true. Okay. So one of the obstacle is the silos in the the political system and the governmental structures, and that's like sounds like as we say a P three uh, uh, turnover. P three over gong to <laughs> Christina. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> yes, we don't. We have a truly global challenge: climate change. We have also other truly global challenges, but this is the most apolitical one, because it's not only 4.5 degrees of warming that we may uh, have uh, in the future, it could even be as bad as 7, 8 degrees, if everything goes on as it has done for some time, uh, towards the end of this century, when my grandchildren, your children, are uh, still alive and <coughs> active. It could be an planet that you cannot live on. It could be disaster, it could be uh, chaos, it could be, uh, well, it's not, it's not, it's something that we never, never been going through before on this planet. And it cannot happen, it must not happen. And a carbon price, of course, that is necessary to have get uh, results quick enough. But we don't have the global institutions that can manage and to produce this kind of conclusions. We already, in 1992, we agreed, all the UN members agreed in to the UNFCC, the uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, and we decided solemnly and signed that we should do everything to stabilize uh, emissions so that we should keep temperature not, uh, from, uh, from increasing. 1992. If we had done that, we wouldn't be. Uh, I wouldn't be talking about this <laughs> apocalyptical uh, threats. Uh, but we didn't. Everything went on as usual. Everything went on as usual. And at that time, we had the debate about is there <coughs> a climate warming or not, and is the human humankind uh, responsible for for the climate warming? We don't have that any longer. <coughs> not in our country, at least. And still we are not doing enough. We are not even close to doing what is needed to meet the goals in Sweden, the, the ambitious Swedish goals. We might meet them halfway in the transport sector, but in other fields we are not. And why not? Well, I'm, I was going to come to that. Am I consuming my time? No. <laughs> well, it's... Um, we don't have the... Uh, we don't... I would say we have the insight, we have the will, we have decided on the goals, but we don't have a strategy, we don't have plans, action plans, and we don't have the means, the instruments, we don't have the organizations that we need to produce change. Mm -hmm. And now we are talking about such a great transformation to change uh, a fossil-driven capitalist civilization economy as ours, interdependent, globally into a fossil free uh, world, a society. It's a huge transformation that we need a co collaboration all over <coughs> all sectors in society, not the least the social sector and the inclusion of people in the change. And our society is organized, our institutions are, um, are uh, following patterns that were laid down a long time ago in a different world and different society, in agriculture society, industrial society. It's only the last 200 years that the problem has, has emerged. And we have institutions from the beginning of the last century, with some changes, of course. But basically, we are organized, as you opened up by saying, in the silo structure, a vertical st structure, that uh, are supposed not to have a holistic, and long-term uh, view, and not s what we need is a system view, a systems approach, mm -hmm. systems analysis, and systems uh, innovations in order to deal with the, the climate warming. And we don't have it. And of course, if you want to change something that is so, so, so enormous, that what I'm talking about now, you have to have the leadership from the top, mm -hmm. of course. It must be the government that is leading this, 
the prime minister, not the least, the prime minister should be the climate minister. And I should see to it that the, all the institutions, the agencies, would transform into this collaborative, horizontal uh, organization where you deal with the problems together. You cannot do it sector by sector. You must do it together. And this is not happening. So, and it didn't happen during uh, the last uh, governance year. Although there has been efforts to raise these questions for a long time. I was working at the Secretariat for Future Studies in the beginning of the 70s when the Prime Minister was Ulf Palme. They, well, we didn't care <laughs> what he said. <laughs> and the same thing has been going on. Globaliseringsrådet, the Future Commission, um, and then last but not least my own effort that lasted for one year and seven months or eight months or something like that. Much too short a time. Uh, and um, the clash between the sectors, the silos, and the, the horizontal, holistic, long-term view was too, too strong. Mm -hmm. It couldn't function. Because the only way to make it function is strong political leadership from the top to change the way all the sectors are working and get a new organization. And, in, and, and, and you notice you had a... You, I, I, you had a, you had a, um, an article, and uh, you, I think you yourself was writing this article, and you talked there about having uh, complex, adaptive, and emergent forces in the public sector. What is what we need to achieve the results? And we don't have that. We have the bureaucratic, top-down, traditional, conventional organizations, and they don't work together. Yeah. And they're not supposed to. They are not given the instructions. I mean, the agencies, the public agencies, they are not giving the regulatory letters. They are not giving the budgets or the instructions that are apt to deal with climate warming. Mm. So, things are. People want to do things to want to do work in a different way, but they are not giving the the permission or the, the task to to actually deliver. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much. I, that was a good advice that the, the climate minister should also be the prime minister to combine no, those. The, opposite. Prime mm. the prime minister should be the clim, uh, climate minister. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to return to something that has been up in the air. Uh, we have discussed <laughs> temperatures, 1.5 until 7, 8 uh, uh, degrees. And as you uh, stressed, we don't know really what, what, where, we're, where we're going. And I have a 16-year-old daughter, Ella. She's fed with climate and sustainability problems. Every day she comes home from her schoolwork, she just finished the ninth uh, degree, and, and say that in history, in Swe Swedish, in English, in, in, in geography, all kind of subjects are uh, they're raising the sustainability uh, uh, problem. So it's difficult to feel hope as a 16-year-old uh, uh, young person today. And then I'm thinking, what leadership do we need to create hope? Or is hope excessive? Överdrivet also. Is hope as phenomena onödigt? Is it panic we need instead of hope? And, and those of you who have read your Greta Thunberg, she talks about panic. I don't want you decision makers to give us hope. I want you to panic, she says. And then I think, yeah, maybe she's right, but then I see my own daughter. She's kind of, okay, maybe it's not really like this, but in her mindset it's like this when she comes home from school sometimes, and they have had lessons about all kind of climate changes. Okay, so do we need hope, or and how, what kind of leadership do we need then if we say, yeah, we need hope to, to deliver hope? John. I think promoting panic is very dangerous. In, in the world's history, panic has never led to good societal development. 
It's of course true that people have to realize that climate change is a major issue that we need to deal with. But doing that with uh, promoting panic is very bad, I think. And you see lots of communication that try to do that. And some of the things that I think is very bad is when they say that uh, uh, if we don't do anything within 10 years, it's too late. Then and everything is going to go to hell. That's not right. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be more costly and maybe more problematic if we wait. But mm -hmm. it's not that things are... Uh, in 10 years, if we don't do all the things that we should do, uh, then it's too late. And what I'm afraid of is that if in 10 years we haven't done sufficiently much, and then people realize that, that what was communicated was not right, mm. and then we are in a much worse situation than if we instead point to <coughs> what I said, that we have a large degree of uncertainty. If we do things cleverly, we can deal with this issue in a cost-efficient way that doesn't need to... Uh, impose large burdens of those on those who cannot take it. Mm, thank you. Uh, Anna? I think it's very important not to panic because I think that gives the wrong, uh, wrong uh, actions and I think we, we need to, and I think one of the problems is that we always discuss as the problems, we never discuss the solutions in a, yeah. in a good way. So if we always, media and politicians and, and us leaders, if we always talk about the big problems and huge problems and the, the disasters that will happen, then we, of course we create panic, but we need to, to, to take a step mm. back from that and, uh, and discuss the solutions and, and weigh the solutions. And I think then, I mean, a 16-year-old always looks a bit depressed, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think then they can, uh, they can uh, kind of realize that the things are happening and uh, the leadership of the, the world is taking this serious. So yeah, I because that, that's the, the other question. One question is, do we need panic? And the other question is, if, how, if we say no on that question, how should we deliver or how should the leadership be then? But I give that question to Kerry. Um, so I think, I think there's a huge problem with schools teaching sustainability and then not actually performing sustainable practices, okay? Because what's that teach, that, te that is teaching young people is that all that they have as a strategy is protest. And that is not true. So if schools teach sustainable problems, they teach challenge, but don't actually also change their own practice, we've got a huge issue there. Um, the second thing is, is that actually we know what it takes to build what we might call non-stupid optimism or critical hope. These are the things that we're looking for. What we're not looking for is wishful thinking. Don't worry, it'll all go away. The magical technology people will fix it, or one single particular policy will fix it, and then we've got no problems. I mean, that's wishful thinking. Um, similarly, you don't want people just to hide away. So what we know is that actually if we say to people... This is the challenge that we're facing, but then precisely as Anna is saying, let's start working together to experiment, mm. to invent, to <coughs> develop new responses and to learn rapidly. And this is where universities, local authorities, industry and others need to be working together to start trying things out. That's why a place like Gotland is interesting because it is going to be trying to figure out how we make this massive institutional transition away from a one form of energy to another. So what we have to do is stop saying we've got a choice between panic or nothing. I mean, this is not the reality. What we have to do is start thinking about how we build courage and you build courage by acting and learning. Mm. Yeah, and thereby constructing the collective intelligence that we need. Yeah. We are lacking in that today. The collective intelligence that takes <coughs> form of political change. And with the respect also of what people, the, the knowledge of people, that they also involve the people in the change. Uh, wh wh so what is collective intelligence? Well, collective intelligence is when, when people as a collectivity is acting intelligent. We are not today. We are acting as a suicidal civilization. Um, as if we want to die in the future. As uh, if I wanted my, chi my grandchildren to, to live the, the horrible life that they could be having in the year 2019. Uh, no. 2099, yes. But what kind of, how should, what leadership do we need to create or to, to, to boost the creativity, uh, the, the collective intelligence then? How, how, how could we kind of push of that forward? Because you must have leaders who act globally, to work together with others. And it is an impossibility, of course, to get the whole world moving at the same time, along the same lines. But we have friends 
Sweden is not the only country that has high ambitions. Many other countries, even Richmond has. <laughs> even. <laughs> and Norway and Denmark and Germany and, and many, many others. We can form alliances mm. and we can move ahead in four hours. We don't have to wait for Bulgaria and Romania <coughs> and Hungary, etc. We can move within the European Union and with others. Mm -hmm. With China, with India. We, we don't dare to work with China because they are, they are not a democracy. We should mm. work. In this sense, we should work with, with mm. China because they, res they, they uh, represent such a huge part of the emissions. Yeah. And so does the United States. And the United States is not ho totally hopeless. I mean, Trump is. <laughs> <laughs> but, but California is mm. way ahead of many yeah. other states. Mm. And they are bigger than Sweden, much mm. bigger. Mm. So there's so much we can do. We can, do. we can start at home and do the right things. And we can go out and work together with others. Mm. And by showing others that it is possible, that you don't have to go into mass unemployment or lower incomes, mm. you can do it. You're keeping a good society uh, alive or for materially. Mm. Uh, you can show others that it's not dangerous. You can go ahead, you too. Mm. You must be much more outwardly. Don't yeah. sit there and be happy being Swedish. Mm. I mean, <laughs> complacency is a Swedish sickness. Okay. Very dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> Jon. I, I, I like Carrie's <laughs> term. Did it, was it uh, intelligent hope? Critical hope or non-stupid optimism. Yeah. <laughs> non-stupid <laughs> optimism. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> as always, we need knowledge, right? I mean, mm. hope is just an emo We want action. That's what we want. How do you get action? Well, you get action when you're clear on what goals you have. Mm. One goal is to make sure this planet doesn't go under, but more concrete goals also of, you know, lowering whatever. Uh, but, uh, and those goals should be very clear, and we should talk about those, and those are shared, even though mm. we also have other goals, like uh, making my little uh, ministry do really well on something completely different. So there's a conflict of goals, and then we need to discuss those conflicts, yes. and what's the more important goal, and so on. Mm. Uh, but uh, we also need knowledge, and the knowledge we need is not just knowledge about how you know, human actions cause this global warming, but also knowledge about what steps we can take that we can, and the kids in the schools need to hear about that too. Exactly. Mm. Um, so I, I, I get, uh, when she says, I don't want your hope, what I take her to be saying is, I don't want you just emotions, mm -hmm. I want action. Yeah. And action requires the knowledge, and uh, let's now uh, talk about this and our goals, because everyone has a shared goal of saving the world in a way, right? Mm. Let's remember that. Mm. Jon. Yeah, so non-stupid optimists, I understand it, that you also mean that for that to work, you should point to good examples, so, yeah. so yeah. how we can do deal with these issues. And I think that's done in a relatively bad way also in the public discussion. I'm not very impressed by, by people buying a Tesla or stopping flying. What I am impressed of is things like the Swedish government and the Swedish, uh, some Swedish EU parliamentarians managed last year to change the working of the EU emission trading system. Mm. That raised the price of emission rights to a level that if it was implemented worldwide would take us a long way towards the solution. Uh, the estimates of the consequences of emissions within EU of this so-called Swedish proposal is that emissions in EU are reduced by 100 times Sweden's yearly emissions. Mm. That's a good example. That should be pointed out to people in schools. Uh, yeah. But instead, they point to the wrong things. Mm. Mm. Kerry. I, I think, I, I'm not sure how helpful it is to set up an opposition between kind of an international policy and sort of small-scale local examples. I think actually, all of these things are necessary, they play a different role. They, none of them work if they pretend to be the only answer to this. So obviously somebody saying don't fly is not the only answer to the major situation. So, you know, it's much bigger than that. The critical <coughs> issue is when we think about, when we think about systems, culture underpins systems, doesn't it? So it's not simply policy and governments don't just act out of self, you know, out of science. They also act out of a sense that people want them to do these things so that they can get elected again. So these are all related to each other, aren't they? So the small actions that you can take on your own, because not everybody can sit in Europe and change the policy. Not everybody can spend their time developing international um, strategies for, for carbon taxes. People have to have a number of different layers on which they can act and to understand that they're part of a much bigger system. So I think what I'd like to, to do is to sort of invite you and, and others who are all working in different ways to see that they're all working 
in a, the same very complex system. And that at one level we need, of course, massive structural change, but also we need cultural change, which means a change in a sense of who I am, what I see as important and what I see as valuable to me. Personally, I don't have very much time at all for Elon Musk, but I do think it's very interesting if you create the conditions where it's desirable to be behaving in different ways, culturally and socially. So I think these things mm. relate to each other rather than necessarily being in opposition. John. No, I, I agree that these issues are, uh, the things that you point to, are important complements. And, and lots of, of things uh, that you point to is going to make it easier, uh, more, more uh, acceptable to people to see this, uh, 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 what's needed, to, to accept these p policies of, of higher climate taxes, for mm. example. So I think it's complementary. But what I'm afraid of is that the focus is on uh, these uh, uh, these things as substitutes, yeah, and that's absolutely. not going to work. And, uh, and I agree with you. So we need something systemic. But what we're actually trying to do here is invent a new civilization. I mean, this is complicated. Yeah. We are effectively trying to figure out how we shift ourselves from one way of being, one sort of mode of dependency to another, which means experiments with different ways of yeah. living and a sense that this might be positive, yeah. that it's not simply a story of constantly reducing and decreasing, but actually mm. that there's huge benefits in some of the ways to shifting towards a different way of living. But the, it's a fact that, that most emission decisions are taken by people acting on markets. Most decisions about technology are also taken by firms uh, acting on markets. And we need, to, uh, we need to change how these markets work. And it's basically simple. The fundamental problem is that carbon is not priced. Mm. Uh, and, and, and that has to be the solution. Yeah. I agree with you, but no, that, I'm going to come gonna, in. I'm going to come in because that's going to kind of I agree, I entirely that's going to uh, that's going to lead yeah. to m lots of these. It's changes, both of these things in the same so, way. So if we've so got people addicted to sugar. All right, we have a sugar tax, we increase the amount it costs, but it also involves other things as well. So I agree, I agree. with you, multiple methods, yeah. but, you see, but we you need see to not put them in opposition. You see a lot of ideas that we should kind of plan, <coughs> put set targets for different sectors of how much emissions we should have, different countries, different regions, even different cities mm -hmm. have targets for emissions. I think that's wrong. We mm -hmm. don't make those decisions about steel use, cement use. We don't decide centrally how much mm -hmm. uh, steel we can use in, in, in or cement in these. Pre and so there is a fundamental lack of understanding of how markets work and how can markets can be affected <laughs> among many of the people who are uh, responsible for climate policy. And that's a big problem. Mm -hmm. OK, I think we give the Sorry. word to Osa and then Anna to finish this discussion. And then we'll open up and see if we have have some questions or comments from uh, from you sitting here yeah just a, a oh, reflection on cultural change yes. how you get that because of course you need a systemic change you need mm. all of this but you need cultural change too mm. and there is this sort of basic psychological fact about human beings like the towels in the hotel room yeah. right we know that that if there's a sign saying it's really good for the environment if you use the same towel again people don't really they throw mm. it on the floor but if there's a sign saying 90 percent of our guests uh, use the same uh, their own towel several days then people hang up their towels, right? So there's that. Mm. That's why you also need it from below, as it were. where, where the social pressure. The social pressure. No. Yeah, I think that no. is a good thing. Anna. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. This is a global problem with global solution. And it's often forgotten, I think, in the media and the discussion. That's the way to solve climate change problem. We need to have the global solutions. But this is also a possibility to communicate better within the local communities and have be people collaborate better. And this is about leadership and from a university perspective maybe this is what the universities can do because we have a possibility of different topics and different uh, student groups and, and have a wider discussion both of the global aspect and the more local regional um, in consequences but also actions. So I think we need both but mm. I, I, I agree that we often forget the global decisions and the global impact because that's where the solution is. I yeah, the, the bigger, it has bigger impact than, than what we do as individuals. Okay, uh, now we have a microphone here and we open up the, the floor and we have, a, actually to be honest we had a gentleman here but you're already up there with a microphone so give it to the lady uh, uh, where you are. So, are you guys hopeful then? <laughs> no. I am, yes. What I does that mean? Do we believe there is, it's worth doing something? Yes. Yes, in that case. Of are. course, I mean, this is, uh, we, we need 
I mean, we, we need to just balance what are the consequences of the climate change? Do we accept those or do we want to limit those? This is a discussion. We need to look at the consequences of what we are doing. But of course, we can, I mean, we are intelligent people. Christina. Of course, it's a wide range of difference between plus two degrees, which may, may be inevitable. Uh, and the plus eight that I was talking about that mm. could happen within 100 years or so. Uh, so we have to do everything we can to keep climate warming from uh, increasing. Uh, mm. We must do everything we can do to, to keep, to make the emissions go down and find, we have to do, I mean, we, there's a lot of technological solutions that we might also need to, to <coughs> Im apply, although we are not quite sure of if they are good or not. We must try, even if we don't have 100% security of, of results. But there's so much we can do that is good for the planet uh, yeah. that is possible to do. We have the knowledge. I'm a little bit scared when I hear that, uh, that you're pointing out Greta as a climate leader. And, and I think there is a substantial risk that uh, when media appoints such leaders uh, or, or influencers, that that will really backfire. Uh, that that uh, conservative movements movements will 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 have a monopoly on the uh, evidence based solutions. So therefore, I, I, uh, you, Klaus, as as as, uh, as an introducer, I think it's a little bit dangerous to to point that out. What we need is evidence based solutions. We need, uh, we need to trust what, uh, what is said. And, and there is a lot of turbulence that I think really can, can move these discussions many years back if we are not very, very careful. Mm. Yeah. Um, up there, I think, we, we had. And then we have one voice over there and one voice down here. And then I think we have to end uh, the seminar. Hi, my name is Waris. I'm a researcher at Stockholm University. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, discussion on climate change. And since yesterday, this has been my third uh, event uh, where uh, it's about climate change. Uh, and uh, when it comes to discussion on climate change, I think Nordic countries, uh, Scandinavia is the champion. Uh, and not only discussion, but the government is also taking uh, some action. But on the other hand, if we see leaders of some countries uh, uh, like US uh, withdrew from uh, Paris Agreement and they are kind of, uh, the leadership is a denier of the climate change and the region that I come from, uh, in South Asia, for example, uh, there is hardly any discussion on climate mm. change and it's not discussed at all. And that's why if we see Afghanistan, for example, is, is suffering uh, from drought, uh, Iran, they have water crisis, India has their own problems, Pakistan. So what can we do here in Sweden, for example, to put this climate, and, and, and it w there was a survey by the World Economic Forum which, which showed that the climate change is the biggest uh, global threat, even more than terrorism. So what, what can we do to put it on the international agenda uh, um, and not only uh, discuss it regionally or, or, or uh, mm. only in Sweden? Thank you. Do we have a Quick response. Well, a lot is being done, but not enough. But the leaders in your countries, in Southeast Asia, for instance, are probably <coughs> very much aware of it, but are not ready to do to take action. Well, similarly to other nations in other parts of the world, uh, but with greater problems within the society and weaker institutions and more corruption and other uh, <coughs> hindrances then it's more difficult, of course, to take up such a, a huge task as to transform a society into a fossil-free society. We could do it. And I'm, I'm a bit ashamed of being part of Swedish society as I've been working in the public sector for such a long time, mm. that we have not done more. I am. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I understand why other, many other countries are, have problems yeah. in launching the, 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 the movement for change. I think we have to take the last question. Time is flying. I'm sorry. The last question up yes. there. Hi, my name is Anna Friedman. I'm the CEO of Legal Works, and I'm so happy to be able to ask this question to a panel that might actually be able to answer it. I have a question about alternative progress indicators. And um, 
Because I'm wondering if it's possible still to have societies that are gearing for productivity and growth of the economic system. Already in the 90s, the Economist Daily said something about that we need to stop uh, treating uh, the earth as a business in liquidation. And I know that New Zealand is using alternative progress indicators and also Sweden, I think. Do you have any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Because also in private, private practice, the different companies are looking for KPIs of, you know, alternative KPIs, not only um, results and so forth, but also green KPIs, so to speak, impact KPIs. John. Do you have any ideas? So GDP or BMP in Swedish is, is often used as a measure of, of, of um, progress. It's of course true that GDP does not tell you anything more than what it is. It is the sum of income. And, and for an individual, we know that income is, doesn't say everything. We need to look at other things, and we of course also do. And policy in the same way has to look at other things like distribution of issues, sustainability, and so on. So GDP should never be taken as more what, than what it is, income. Uh, uh, I think, though, that some people believe that, that a lot of problems are solved by changing the definition of GDP or having other measures being put into an indicator. I don't think that's right. We should kind of focus on the, 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 the true source of the problem, and that's not an accounting issue. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, an applause. Uh, thank you for participating in a very important uh, issue and we believe in fact and for that reason I would like to give you a drawing from one of the first students we had at the university back in 14, uh, uh, 1477. It was a guy from Gotland coming over to Uppsala and he made some drawings in one of his first uh, classes. And you could use it as a, a, a mouse pad. Thank you very much.